God of my presence. God of my future. He's holding me. Amen. I love that song. It speaks to my heart. Speaks to my faith. It speaks to my resolve. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I don't need any more convincing. Come on, I like to just sing about who he is and what he does. And it blesses my soul. Sometimes you got to minister to yourself. Sometimes you got to speak the words of encouragement to yourself. And it's nice when it comes in a song. And you can sing along with that song. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Once again, happy Father's Day to all the fathers that are out there today. Uh, give a shout out to Zim. Wonderful testimony about his father. Real life story. Amen. And what's taking place in the world that we live in. Not on the make believe uh, life stories that you see on TV, but real life circumstances of what takes place in the lives of people every single day. Amen. And how God redeems us and redeems our oh, hallelujah, and reconciles our relationships. Isn't that awesome? I love it when God does that. Amen. Come on, stand on your feet. I got a message for you today. The heart of a father. And I just want to take my time today. Is it okay if I, if I just teach today? Amen. Amen. Come on, grab somebody by the hand. We're going to go ahead and we're going to pray and we're going to get started. And once again, I'm just excited about what God is doing and what he has done and what he desires to do in your life. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. And what shall we do? We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. So, Father, once again, in the name of Jesus, we come to you. And, Lord, we ask that you would give us a word, that you would speak to our hearts, to our minds, uh, to the core of our being and our souls. Ooh, hallelujah. That you would show up in every circumstances and let your children know who you are, that you are the father of fathers. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Come on. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand praise. And you may be seated. Amen. A father's heart. I love this subject. It's a, it's a powerful subject. It's a subject that I've dealt with all of my life as a child, as a teen, come on, as a young man, um, becoming an older, mature man, and then becoming a father myself, and uh, understanding the depth of what it means to be a father. So there's no greater responsibility for a man than becoming a father. That is your greatest responsibility. But one of the greatest ills of our society is that fathers are missing in their ch children's lives. And one worse than that, the idea of a missing father or missing a father in someone's life is this idea is that people think that fathers are no longer necessary. So through whether traditional means that your father becomes your father through marriage or unconditional means he becomes your father through being a stepfather or a grandfather, a mentor, or even a big brother that you become a father is critical in the lives it is necessary in the upbringing of children. God even gives us spiritual fathers to the children of today, meaning that a Christian man who gives his life to Christ takes the time to become a father to a child in need. But regardless of what position you find yourself in as a father, the need is the same. And you may ask the question, what is a good father? Where do we find this example from? There is no greater example than our Heavenly Father, who is the father of fathers. 
When the disciples asked Jesus, they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And Jesus revealed the most amazing revelation about God. That when we pray to God, he says, I want you to do this. You're not just praying to God alone, but you're praying not just to the alpha and the omega and the beginning and the end, the first and the last, et cetera, et cetera. But more importantly, you are praying to your heavenly father. Jesus reveals this relationship that God has designed. And so he wants us to address him as father. It is the more deeper, intimate, defining relationship that we can have with God. And so when we say our father which shot in heaven, holy be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This defines our relationship that we have a God, a father who is holy. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. It defines this relationship that involves his kingdom, that he is a king and that he has a kingdom. It defines that even his kingdom is about good and not evil. Even Jeremiah weighs in on the of the heart of God and the heart of a father. He says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you what? A future and a hope. Oh, hallelujah. You know, it's amazing how people think of God. They never really think of God as a father that listens, that wants the good for you and not the bad. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Even Jesus, when he found himself in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying to the Father, he adds the most enduring name to the Father that you and I need to know and understand. Jesus is in the Garden, and even though he's saying, Father, can you, can you change or take away this cup? Then Jesus even goes, but he says, but Abba, Father. And that word Abba simply means, it means Papa or Daddy. Can you, can you take away this cup from me? I, I am here. I'm your child. I, I don't want to die like this. Oh, hallelujah. But nevertheless, let your will be done. The apostle Paul later explains this relationship that takes place. It's when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He says it in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 and 16. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Papa, Daddy, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are what? We are children of God. He goes on even further in the book of Galatians and he says, for when the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son born of a woman under the law to redeem those who were under the law that they might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons and you are daughters, God has sent forth his spirit into his sons and to his daughters to, to their hearts where they will cry out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer slaves, but a son. And if a son and a daughter, then you are an heir of God through Christ Jesus. Oh, if the people of God understood the heart of the Father. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. So God becomes the father to the fatherless. Everything that your earthly father could not be, God, your heavenly father, becomes. Let me say that again because some people miss it. Sometimes we're trying to get something from people that have given you all they have. Everything that your earthly father could not be, your heavenly father becomes. And I like to explain it like this. He becomes the four P's. You say, what are you talking about, the four P's? He becomes your protection, your provision, your parent, and your priest. Ooh, hallelujah. Let me say that again, because you, you might need to take a note on that. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, God, your father, your heavenly father becomes your protection, your provision, your parent, 
and your priests. A father's job is to protect his children from all the dangers of the world. This means, come on, that he's constantly, consistently being aware, listen to this, of the dangers seen and unseen. Let me say that again. He's constantly aware. He constantly knows what's going on. Oh, hallelujah. In his neighborhood, in his nation, in his family. He knows what's going on. Why? Because he's attentive. Because he wants to protect what? His children. The scripture goes on and says, what? Train up a child in the way it should go. And when he is old, he shall not depart. But before a father can train up a child in the way he should go, he must first know the way. Hallelujah. You can't, come on, you can't do that scripture, hallelujah, until you know the way yourself. How can you show somebody the way if you don't know the way? Hallelujah. So fathers are failing today because they don't know the ways of God. They're failing in what? Raising their children and showing them the way because they don't know the way, the father of fathers, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Before you can train up a child in the way, the father must know how to protect himself from the dangers of seen and unseen. Oh, hallelujah, somebody. In other words, if I don't know how to stay out of trouble, if I don't know how to protect myself, how can I show my child how to stay out of trouble and how to protect them from the unseen dangers of, come on, of this world? Come on, somebody. Before you can protect others and show others, you've got to know it yourself. Listen to Proverbs chapter 4, and this is actually... C- some scripture between one and seven, but I just want to read this to you, not in its entirety, but I just want to pull out some pieces. Number one says, it says, hear my children, the instructions of a father and give attention to knowing and understanding. He says, for I give you good doctrine. Do not forsake my laws. Let your heart retain my knowledge and keep my commandments and live. He says, get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get an understanding. This wisdom is the heart of a father that desires to protect his children. So first, again, first P is what? Protection. The second P is provision. Provision begins with the children's needs, not their wants. They need food, shelter, clothing. They need correction in the time of they've done something wrong. Come on. A father's supposed to, listen this, provide protection even from their own foolishness. Giving a child everything they want is just as dangerous as a wolf in sheep clothing. They'll bring harm to themselves. Giving a child everything they want, come on, gives them a sense of entitlement. Children are gullible because they're immature and inexperienced. I want to tell you a testimony, a sad one. Something I experienced when I was in high school, my first year in high school, I'll never forget. One of the parents had brought one of my classmates. He was much older than I think he was a junior. But they had brought him a brand new car, a Dodge Charger, RT440. If anyone knows anything about cars, that's a very powerful car. And of course, all, we're like kids. All of us were like, oh, I wish our parents could, could buy or could afford us a new car. You know, you could imagine the envy from the other guys that are going around the school. They just wanted, they're looking at this car and everybody's like, oh, wow, the word spread throughout all of the high school. Wow, he's not only got a car. Come on, cars weren't, a lot of students had cars, but man, he had a brand new car that everybody wanted. And I'll never forget the day 
we heard the news. There was an accident. And see, I was still on the bus at that time. And I'll never forget the day that the bus passed by. The car was flipped up, upside down. They were racing down Skyline Boulevard. And he lost control. And unfortunately, the one parent that bought him this car, their son didn't make it. The gentleman that was with him lived, but the son didn't make it. The people that were racing, they lived, but the one that owned and had the brand new car, he didn't make it. Giving a child everything they want does not protect them from their immaturity and their inexperience. A father provides, but he also protects. He has the wisdom. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. He's gone on ahead of the child. He's made mistakes. He knows which way, come on, to turn them because he's been there and he's made mistakes himself. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 says it like this. And the father, do not provoke your children to wrath. Don't make your children angry for no reason. For, for your, listen, this, don't make your children angry with your own immaturity. You have to protect the father. Listen, listen. Oh, hallelujah. Even fathers have to do what? They have to learn to protect their children from their own ignorance and their own immaturity and their own what? Inexperience. Oh, hallelujah. And so the scripture tells us to stop being immature. Don't make your children angry for no reason. But bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. What is that talking about? Training and love instructions. So our first P is protection. Our second is provision. The third P is parenting. What is a parent supposed to do? A parent supposed to guide they help their children with their decisions and they help them develop an understanding of right and wrong. Training prepares them for a world, both good and bad, a world that some cases can do them harm. Life's lessons are not restricted to the classroom. Let me say that again. Sometimes we want the teachers to do everything. We think it's the educational system, but life's lessons is not restricted to a classroom in a book. You do well to, to learn that and know that. And so our first P again is protection, provision, parenting. And our last P is the priest. Let's talk about the priest for a minute. The priest is the one that, in the Old Testament, is the one that brings the animals to the altar and sacrifice. They're the ones that stand between God and the people. You can never be a priest. You can never do ministry. You can never work for God unless you pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow it. it will, a priest will always be required to be a part, some part of a sacrifice. Now, in the New Testament, that you are the sacrifice. In the Old Testament, the animal is the sacrifice. But in the New Testament, come on, come on, when you become a father, come on, under the New Covenant, you become the sacrifice. When Azim bought his brother some clothes, that was a sacrifice. Trying to do good. You, you can't be a father without a sacrifice. Scripture says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that who should ever what? Believe in him should not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. Do you not believe or understand that the father had to give his son up as a sacrifice for you? 
Do you not understand that he had to turn his back on his father and let all all of your sin and, and my sin and all the lies and the, and the cheating, hallelujah, and the evil that went on and goes on in the world today, hallelujah, he had to turn his back, come on, on his only son who did nothing wrong, who was innocent, by the way, oh, hallelujah, of all sins and charged that sin, come on, to him. For you. The priest knows all too well that a real priest, a father, he's a sacrifice. He must be willing to give his life, both physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, for his children. The father is also an intercessor. He stands between the father of fathers. You know, fathers, you don't have to be everything. The world tells you you have to be everything. No, you need to know how to get to the one who knows everything. Oh, hallelujah. Stop trying, to, stop trying to please everybody and be everything. Hallelujah. Some folks you'll never satisfy. Oh, hallelujah. But I know the one. Hallelujah. Come on. Who is the satisfaction of everything? Hallelujah. You need to know that one. Hallelujah. And become that intercessor from on for your children as my mother and father interceded for me. He's a priest. Oh, I'd like to see the father. In other words, you will stay on your knees. In today's society and the way things are going today, you will constantly be on your knees. I'd like to end with a story that Jesus tells about the prodigal son. You guys, you know the story. This is about an immature young man who came of age and said, Father, give me my inheritance. Yes, come on. Like he like the father really owed him something. You know, entitlement. And he took his money and just ran. And the Bible goes on and talks about him. The scripture goes like this. It says. Then he said, a certain man who had two sons and a young of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided it to his father and he left. The father divided to him, he left. The father knows that he must let him go. That he cannot control his child at this age. You know, I, I love that serenity prayer. It's just so much for me. As a parent, let me, let me help you out here. It goes, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. As a parent, you need to know that if God himself does not intervene in your child's will, you can't. God grant me the peace to accept the things, I, I, I can't change it. But then you do what? You put your trust in God. Scripture goes on and it says, and not many days after the young son gathered all together to journey to a far country. And there he wasted his possessions with riotous living. But when he had spent all that he had, there arose a famine in the land and he began to want. Oh, I love the sovereignty of God. Do, do you hear this story? In, in other words, he says, listen, listen God waited till he spent all his money. See, see you, whether you realize or not, when you're interceding, oh, hallelujah, come on, when you're interceding for your kids, hallelujah, and you see them doing all of this wrong and you can't figure it out and you're, you're out of control, God, hallelujah, God's got your back. Don't worry about it. God waited till the young man ran out of everything. I'm going to let you go right on ahead and do everything you can do, but but when you run out of everything and you come to the end of yourself, because that's the time and that's the only time that I know, come on, that you will hear what I have to say. Hallelujah. Oh, look at God. Look at God work that thing. Somebody say, God work that thing. 
waited till he ran out of all his money. And the Bible goes on and says, and then he joined himself to the citizens of that country. You got to understand something. A lot of people skip over this. They miss this. Come on, somebody say, say, drop this knowledge, pastors. Come on, somebody say, drop this knowledge. This was a Jewish young man. Oh, somebody got it already. Come on. He joined himself to the Gentiles. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And then they turned around and sent them to the field. Come on, to feed the pigs. If you were a Jew, come on, you would understand that the Gentiles were considered dogs and a pig was considered unclean. You can't get any lower. Pigs were considered unclean ceremonially. They were unclean and unholy and ungodly. Matter of fact, the pig was so dirty and so, listen, you got to understand something about this pig. Leviticus verse 11, 8 tells us about the ceremonial uncleanness of a pig. But what you need to understand about this is the most gluttoned, unclean, filthy animal of all the animals in the world. It is nothing. Look, they will not stop eating. There is nothing they will not eat. And they were so unclean. Come on, that God says in his word, I don't even want you to touch it. That's how unclean it was considered to be. Now, some people think it was restricted to a what? A dietary restriction. But you missed the point. The point really didn't have a lot to do with you eating it more than it had to do with the symbolicness of it. That listeners, that you cannot offer a pig to God as a sacrifice. God said it's so unholy, it's so ungodly. Oh, hallelujah. Don't even offer that to me as a sacrifice. And so God is saying, you can't, you can't offer your filth. You can't, you can't bring that to my table. Hallelujah, for I am holy. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. That's why Jesus had to die. That's why the blood had to be spilled. So he could cleanse all and wash away all of our filth. Hallelujah. So that we could become a living, holy sacrifice acceptable to, to God. Hallelujah, which is his reasonable service, somebody say. And so God did this because he did not want the other nations. The other nations used a pig as an offering to the underworld. Somebody say teach. The other nations, even what Egypt and Rome, they would offer pigs unto their gods, to the underworld and to demons. Oh, hallelujah. So God, come on, did not want the Jews, the chosen people, come on, to, to have anything to do with the pig or to, uh, to the understanding that they would offer something to the devil and his demons. Verse 15 says it like this. And then he went on a journey again. And joined himself, what, to the citizens of that country. And he was gladly, what, being fed his stomach, filled his stomach with the food that would swines eat. And no one gave him anything. So he, not, he became basically a pig. And somebody say, but that's what it took. Him to come to himself. I love this part. And he says, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and I perish in hunger? Sometimes we only focus on that part. But but look at what it took for him to come to himself. In other words, when he came to himself, listen, listen, when he came to himself, he came up. He he says, look, I've been I was brought up better than this. I, I, I know better. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. In other words, all that teaching, all that fathering, all the seeds that the father had planted. Hallelujah. All that God had told him, all that the father has showed him. He came to himself and he realized there's a better way. This is not the right way. Come on. I know the way. This ain't it. I'm going to go to my father's house. Oh, hallelujah. And if I have to become a humble servant to him. That's what I'll do. So he rose up and went to his father's house. And he came to his father and said to his father, I've sinned. I've sinned before heaven 
and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of the servants, a hired servant. And here's the heart of the father. See, the world's got it all messed. The heart of a father in the world is you got to be perfect. You got to have, you got to graduate with straight A's. You got to be the best athlete. You got to do everything right. See, the, 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 the way the world sees it, hallelujah. Come on, I can only be proud of you when you're that perfect child. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, but the heart of the heavenly father is to understand your sinful nature. Oh, hallelujah, that you are human. Hallelujah. And he says, hallelujah. Well, hallelujah. And the heart of the father is that your eyes would be open and that you would be saved and that you would know his heavenly father. And he arose and came to his father. And when his father was listening, his, I love this part. And when he was a still a great ways off, his father saw him and had compassion. Listen. And the father ran. The, guy, the, the, the boy didn't run. The father ran. And the father fell on his neck and kissed him. He had been with the pigs. I'm sure he was smelly, dirty, but the father ran to him, fell on his neck. He recognized the far off. He recognized his son afar off. He had been looking. That's the thing about a heart of a father. The father looks for the day that his children will come to themselves. He prays and he intercedes. He never stops praying and he continues to pray until his children, they come to themselves because he know one day it's going to happen. And he recognizes his son's heart. He may not have recognized him on the outside, but he recognized his heart that he had changed that he had repented. He recognized his hurt and his pain. He recognized his need for mercy and his need for forgiveness and his need for acceptance, his need for the agape love of God. He recognized it. That's what the father, that's how the father sees us. He recognizes our need. And he meets us where we are. Protection. Provision. Parenting. And a priest. This is the heart of our father who is the father's of fathers. Man, if you want an example, look to the Father. He'll never let you down. Paul said it like this Follow me as I follow Christ. Come on, let's lift the Lord a hand, praise.